Greetings. Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent, March 27th, 2022. Participating in this service, Shane Donnelly, reader and video photographer, and myself. With over 1,000 purple, red, green, and gold glass votive jars, the church will be encircled by a luminaria on Palm Sunday night, the 10th of April, between the hours of 8 and 11 p.m. If there is rain, the event is scheduled for the next day, Monday, the same hours. If in the area, drive by the church to feast your eyes upon the candlelight, enhancing our outdoor Easter decorations. You have a good day. Welcome. Each week we visit a different country and a culture and how they keep Lent, Holy Week, and Easter. And today we're going to Germany. Germany is a, a sizable country in Western Europe, large population, and many of the people belong to the Lutheran Church or to the Catholic Church. And like Christians everywhere, the Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday. Now, a long time ago, there was no way in Germany for people to get palms. So they had to use what was available. And what they create, and they still follow the old tradition, is a palm bush. And they take branches of hollow, of pine, of pussy willows, and they make a bunch and they tie ribbons on it. And there are parades in the streets, in the villages and in the town. And sometimes they get to be very elaborate. As you see here, they put them on poles decorated with Easter eggs and flowers. And later, they will be planted in the yard or even put in a field. And it is said that if you do this on Palm Sunday, that it's going to make your garden productive and you're gonna get a, a yield from the fruits and the vegetables that you plant. Now, another thing that takes place in Germany on Thursday, the day that we remember that Jesus had the Last Supper and when he prayed in the garden and later was arrested, in Germany they call it Green Thursday. And like everybody eats something green, you gotta eat green foods so you're gonna have good luck in the months ahead. And what you will find people eating are spinach 
and asparagus. Do you like spinach and asparagus? I guess you can eat anything green, but that, that is the tradition. Then on Good Friday, people go to church as we do here, and what is really famous from Germany, they have a passion play. And the passion has to do with the death of Jesus. And these used to be found everywhere. There's fewer of them today. But the most famous one is in a German village called Oberammergau. And it has been going on for 400 years. I saw the 350th anniversary production. Now you can see the stage, and this year it will be performed. Any year ending with a zero, they put it on all summer long, the people in the town. And the reason why they do this, they made a promise to God. If you spare our community from the plague, they had a, a pandemic we will do something wonderful to tell people about the love of Jesus. And so for 400 years, they had been putting on this production. It takes an entire day. And then you can see the big crowd of people under, look kind of like an airport hangar. And the stage has live animals and, and choirs. It takes seven hours. You see part of the play, take a lunch break and go back for the remainder. And you can see how spectacular and dramatic it is. The people in the town dressed up with Jesus and the thieves on the cross. So this is uh, something that continues. And this year, the play will be put on because it couldn't be done in 2020 because of COVID. Then on Easter Eve, in towns all over Germany, there are big bonfires and people gather at night and they sing songs. And what are they burning? The Christmas trees. The live Christmas trees that they used dried up. And another thing that they do, and you'll see this in Germany, they have hay wheel rolling. That is a bale of hay that they roll down the hills to create some excitement. And again, the crowd of people filled with the sense of excitement. Now in Germany, they have an Easter well. In the center of town, they create very beautiful and elaborate displays using flowers and eggs, as you find here. And another thing, many of the popular traditions that we associate with Easter came from Germany. Millions of people living in the United States have their grandparents who came from Germany and they brought their Easter ideas with them. And they include the Easter egg hunt, an Easter tree, also an Easter basket, and the Easter bunny. All came from Germany. Now, we have an Easter basket, but what you're likely to find in Germany are paper mache eggs and these are filled with candy and they're hidden and you go out on a hunt looking for for your easter egg now this tray these are all candies that are actually made in germany and this large paper mache egg with these novelties and candy more commonplace in Europe than in America, but it's becoming more popular in America, is to have foiled covered chocolate. And they make them decorative and very beautiful, as you see here. And in Germany, you wouldn't be Easter without eating a lamb cake. And Jesus is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. And here is the connection with the Easter Bunny. This is an actual photograph of the moon. And when you use your imagination and you look at the dark shadow on the moon, doesn't it kind of look like a rabbit? Yeah, look, see the, see the rabbit outline? And long ago, people would look up at the moon and our Easter is dated, it changes every year it's the first Sunday after the first full moon 
after the first day of spring. That's why it changes all the time. And the earth would be close to the moon, and parents would say, well, see that rabbit on the moon? He's going to jump down here, and he's going to bring you your treat for Easter. So that, that, that came from, from Germany. And even our greeting, Happy Easter, Germans say Frohe Oster. And you can almost see the word Easter in Ostern. And it means Happy Easter. And so from Germany, we join with our Christian brothers and sisters in the Rhineland, and we welcome this wonderful time of the year, spring with new life, and new life that we receive in Jesus. You have a good day. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. This is found in chapter 27, verses 11 through 31. I am reading scripture from the New International Version Bible. Christ's trial before Pilate and the mocking and scourging. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? He knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ, asked Pilate. And they all answered, Crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears, is the opening line of a speech delivered by Mark Antony after the assassination of the dictator Julius Caesar. Our month July is named for this ancient autocrat. And August is after Augustus Caesar, nephew of Julius, his successor, and the first emperor. The gladiator Spartacus led a slave revolt. The orator Cicero, the poet Juvenal, 
and the philosopher Seneca. A civil servant appointed by Tiberius Caesar showed up for work early one Friday morning on a spring day, and due to his unscheduled speedy trial and a six-hour execution, became known to more people on the planet than most of the rulers, generals, athletes, and men of the arts and sciences of the once mighty Roman Empire. His name, Pontius Pilate. Every occasion a Christian recites the Apostles' Creed, participates in the Stations of the Cross, or reads the New Testament account of the crucifixion, attention is given to the name of Pilate, which will live on in infamy. This fourth in a Lenten sermon series on the personalities of the Passion finds us taking a look at a pivotal character in the drama of salvation. The focus of this message is the meaning of the phrase suffered under Pontius Pilate. Number one, the mention of Pontius Pilate in our affirmation of faith gives a historical legitimacy to the life of Christ and to our religion. Why does the creed insert the name of Pontius Pilate? The sentence could as well read, suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried. The statement of faith does not list the names of the apostles or the prophets or even the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, on whose records the creed itself depends. Three proper names appear in the second paragraph, Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, and Pontius Pilate. By adding Pilate, the early church fathers who formulated the creed and saw it as a clear and a concise doctrinal document, sought to define for all subsequent generations that the life of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, was not a tale about a guy once upon a time, long, long ago, in a faraway place. The greatest story ever told does not take place in Mr. Rogers' land of make-believe. Jesus of Nazareth, Mother Mary, and Pontius Pilate are actual people who resided in an actual geographical location and in an actual identifiable time period. Kevin DeYoung of the Gospel Coalition and a Reformed Presbyterian pastor in North Carolina is among my favorite authors. He makes the following appraisal in Taking God at His Word. This cannot be stated too strongly. From the very beginning, Christianity tied itself to history. The most important claims of Christianity are historical claims, and on the facts of history, the Christian religion must stand or fall. During an open house parent-teacher conference, a teacher disclosed to Jimmy's mom and dad that their son was failing history. The father spoke up, Sir, I was never very good at history. And the instructor replied, Well, I see that history is repeating itself. Too many of God's people hold to the viewpoint of Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company. History is bunk. And the result of this perspective is that we rob ourselves of a firm foundation for our faith. Are you aware that ancient writers outside the Bible made mention a pilot supplying us with background information about him? Two first century notables, Flavius Josephus and Philo of Alexandria, both Jewish sources, lead us to conclude that Pilate was a political opportunist and not a very nice guy, adding fuel to the smoldering fire in the Holy Land. Tacitus was a later Roman historian, substantiating the appointment of this military governor and his orders for the death penalty of our Lord. For decades, liberal university elites, the higher critics, subscribed to the view that Pilate 
was a fictional invention by the early followers of Christ. Doctrinal dissertations were presented seeking to persuade us there never was a Roman prefect governing Judea by the name of Pilate. And guess what? Here we find the value of archaeology. In 1961, a team unearthed at an amphitheater in Caesarea a limestone block with the name Pontius Pilate chiseled in Latin. It is housed in the museum in Israel. In addition, bronze coins bearing the name of Pilate have been discovered in archaeological digs verifying the existence of this Roman governor. It can be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Pilate held this post for a decade, 26 to 36 AD. When we recite suffered under Pontius Pilate, we are going in a time machine and pinpointing a person, a period of history and a place which really exists. Family of God, do not allow yourselves to be buffaloed by the anti-Christian think tank with an agenda to shred the faith once delivered unto the saints. Our faith has a credibility which has stood the test of time. Number two, why does the creed single out Pilate with a negativity? Isn't it more accurate to say that Jesus suffered under Judas Iscariot, the scribes and the Pharisees, Caiaphas, Annas, the Sanhedrin, King Herod Antipas, the crowd calling for the release of Barabbas, or even the Roman soldiers. Yes, Pilate fired the trigger, but didn't all these culprits load the gun? Why should Pilate be the whipping boy for the act of injustice perpetrated on Jesus when there were numerous accomplices? And the reason for Pilate's unique inclusion, he stands as a continual reminder to us of governmental authority actively opposed to Christ. Rather than render the past term verb suffered, read the clause present tense, suffers under the Pontius Pilots of this world. Jesus Christ was not killed by a bunch of vigilantes taking matters into their own hands or by a gang of hoodlums looking for a thrill. He encountered state-sponsored injustice, brutality, and death carried out by a legal authority. Before his dramatic Damascus Road conversion experience, Saul of Tarsus, or Paul, was a persecutor of the followers of Jesus. Dispatched by the temple hierarchy to go to Damascus and arrest Christians and toss them into the dungeon, Christ appeared to Paul in a vision with the call, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Not why are you persecuting my disciples, but why are you persecuting me? As the grand teacher taught that when we feed, clothe, and house one of the least of his brethren, we are doing it as unto him. By the same token, any attack upon a Christian for his or her faith and values is an assault upon Christ. So this is the extended understanding of he suffers under the Pontius Pilots of this world. The Voice of the Martyrs, Open Doors USA, and the American Center for Law and Justice are persecution watchdog organizations. Right now, the most dangerous country on earth to be a Christian is Afghanistan. For the first time in a decade, North Korea was knocked out of its number one spot. Globally, 200 million Christians somewhere on the globe face persecution. 300 Christians are killed daily for their religion. During Sunday worship, pastors are killed. 
the children kidnapped and sold into human trafficking, and the churches burned to the ground. Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, and he suffered under Lenin and Stalin in Russia, and Hitler in Germany, and Mussolini in Italy, and Chairman Mao Zedong in China, and Idi Amin in Uganda, and now suffers under Kim Jong-un in North Korea. When the powers at the top find a challenge to their diabolical policies, and Christians will not yield, and resist as a spiritual and moral conscience to the nation, a drive is launched to permanently silence them. And like their Lord, these persecuted Christians, finding themselves in conflict with temporal authorities, are arrested in the night, mocked in scorn, subjected to a sham trial, beaten, tortured, and experience hideous forms of death. Are we aware of the plight of our brothers and sisters in the family of God? Do we pray for their protection, support groups calling for freedom of religion, fund relief for their survival? Jesus Christ continues to suffer at the hands of the pilots of our age who inflict pain and misery on his followers called by his name. Number three, suffered under Pontius Pilate could be rendered, Jesus Christ suffered a gross miscarriage of justice by the Roman judicial system, which took pride in its courts and laws. The trial of Jesus Christ is the most famous trial in history. Three times in the proceedings, Pilate expressed his belief that Jesus was not guilty of a crime warranting death. Making use of the Passover amnesty, the voice of the people determined the release of the notorious evildoer Barabbas and the execution of the young carpenter of Galilee. Commanding his soldiers to flog our good Lord, Pilate sought to appease this bloodthirsty mob. Likely bound and stripped to the waist, the legionnaires inflicted great damage to the torso of our Savior. Pilate may have been trying to strike a sensitive chord with the crowd, bringing out Jesus beaten to a pulp and dressed like a buffoon in his royal regalia with the announcement, Behold the man, or what's left of him. Like a school of sharks, the opponents of the Lord demanded not only his blood, they wanted his neck. Away with him! Crucify him! Taking a basin, water, and a towel, Pilate washed his hands of the entire affair. During the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, on the floor of the United Nations, Adelaide Stevenson pressed the ambassador from the USSR to answer questions about the presence of nuclear weapons on the Caribbean island. The Soviet ambassador responded by saying that he was not in an American courtroom and he would not be questioned as if he were. And Stevenson replied, Sir, you are in the court of world opinion. The consensus of public opinion across the centuries with the case of the Roman government versus Jesus of Nazareth, the judgment of the judge Pontius Pilate dodge doing the right thing, and that we must dedicate ourselves to make certain that this judicial tyranny is no longer repeated. Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, and he continues to suffer and is crucified afresh and put to an open shame whenever and wherever justice is not rightly administrated by the officials authorized to see to it that it is carried out. Every schoolboy in America knows that Abraham Lincoln was taught to read by his stepmother, a school teacher, when a young man, Honest Abe, was employed at a general store. And in the back room, he found some books in a barrel, which the shopkeeper gave to him, like a treasure chest. 
Lincoln poked his nose in the four volumes, Commentaries of the Laws of England, by the 18th century British judge, William Blackstone, which propelled him to become an attorney and later aim for the White House. William Blackstone stressed with all trials, it is better that 10 guilty persons escape punishment than one innocent suffer. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police have as their motto, we always get our man. What are the statistical odds for this percentile? Don't worry, we get the right man 90% of the time. Pilate got the wrong man. Christ is the best example of judicial per perversion. My late father was prone to say that doctors bury their mistakes. His son Fred would add, judges sweep their mistakes under the rug. In 1972, Vicki Lawrence, star on The Carol Burnett Show, climbed to the top of the hit parade with a song, The Night the lights went out in Georgia. A ballad about an innocent man hanged for the murder of his promiscuous wife. The Gospels report that as Christ was suspended on the cross, a darkness covered the land. It was the day that the lights went out in Jerusalem. A judge sentenced an innocent man to the cross. Jesus' trial conducted by Judge Pontius Pilate is a painful reminder. All legal systems are fallible. The law of averages should teach us that it is inevitable that a percentage of all court convictions and state-authorized capital punishments will end the life of the wrong person. And Christ is a best example of this judicial mistake. His suffering under Pontius Pilate should prompt us to recommit ourselves to the pledge we make to the flag, the extension of justice, not for a few, for some, or for many, but for all. Number four, suffered under Pontius Pilate underscores failed political leadership. Pilate was a governor without a backbone, caving in the pressure, repeatedly vacillating his decision, unable to stand up for his beliefs and values, and in the name of expediency, permanently remove the troublemaker, Jesus of Nazareth. The majority of Americans are disenchanted with governmental leadership at every level. For our current officials elected or appointed in too many cases, follow the same unacceptable practices which culminated in the crucifixion. And it seems to appear that the primary ambition of these professional men and women is to hold on to power at all costs and to use their office not only to tell the rest of us how to live our lives, for they know better what is good for us than we know ourselves, but to use their authority to feather their own nest. If word got back to headquarters that appointee governor Pilate was weak, ineffective, soft with maintaining law and order, and upsetting the religious hierarchy, he ran the likelihood of standing in the unemployment line. And just as elected officials must capitulate to the demands of donors, constituents, and special interest groups, Pilate had to answer to the ecclesiastical bigwigs for his self-preservation and promotion. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, we are informed that the Roman soldiers guarding the tomb of Christ after the resurrection reported to the chief priest. Chapter 28, verse 12. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, 
we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. A possible insinuation is that the big kahunas at the temple conspired to grease the palm of Pilate to look the other way and not charge the military sentry for dereliction of duty by sleeping on the job. Doesn't every man have a price? A lobbyist sought to approach a senator with a new car. Oh, I can't take that. It would be bribery. Okay, I'll sell you this car for $50. Fine, in that case, I'll take two. An honest politician is said to be one who, when he is bought, will stay bought. I couldn't locate which comedian said it, but a well-known funny man in his comic routine made the wise crack that America has the best judges money can buy. Men and women in office do not fall from heaven. They emerge from the rank and file of the nation. And the popular adage runs that if they are not already compromised and corrupted before they go to Harrisburg or Washington, the temptation awaits them. Suffered under Pontius Pilate is a constant reminder that we must be vigilant and keep governmental leadership under surveillance and accountable for their actions. Christ suffered, you suffer, I suffer, we all suffer by those with power, without courage and conviction, abuse authority for their own ends, bringing destruction and death. Five and last. Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate. Would we have done anything differently if we had been in Pilate's shoes? Each year for six weeks, Lent and Holy Week, we are forced to relive in song, liturgy, sermons, art, and drama, the betrayal, denial, desertion, the false trials, miscarriage of justice, mocking and scourging, the heavy weight of the cross, the execution and death of our Savior and Lord. We reflect and re-examine our individual and collective participation in the Lord's sufferings. The question is not, who crucified Christ, but what? Every age has its number of unscrupulous leaders, fanatical righteous headhunters, spineless jellyfish who stand for nothing, and turncoats switching to the winning side. A vocal angry mob called for the release of Barabbas. This ungodly minority dominated the decision-making at the trial. Pilate's wife sent her man a message urging him not to condemn Jesus. She had a disturbing dream about this innocent prophet the night before. Pilate had a discernment that it was out of envy that the ecclesiastical mafia desired to get rid of Jesus. These men of the cloth cloak their evil scheme with religiosity. Unfortunately, Pilate ignored his better judgment, the counsel of his wife, and his gut reaction as to what the chief priests were up to. The great British statesman Edmund Burke sounded the alarm with his warning, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. When I was in high school, I read Profiles in Courage by then Senator John F. Kennedy. Kennedy was bestowed the Pulitzer Prize in Literature in 1956 for his collection of short stories about Americans who took unpopular stands during critical moments in the nation's history. And due to their courage, they suffered severe criticism and losses. If these men and women had not stepped to the plate and refused to kowtow to the prevailing mood and mindset of their time, America, as we know and love her, would not have existed. With political correctness going amok, fear of charges of hate speech, 
disinformation intentionally spread across the land and finding spiritual and moral darkness engulfing everywhere, Christ is suffering because his people, like Pilate, bend to the crowd, making the most noise, ignore the counsel of a righteous woman like Claudia, wife of the prefect, receiving supernatural knowledge, alerting us to our moral decision-making, and not using discernment, making sense of the evil unleashed. The 19th century African-American social reformer Frederick Douglass said it right, one and God make a majority. Whose side are we on? When we take a stand for the Lord and his kingdom and its righteousness, we stand in his sovereign strength. Al Denson is a popular Christian recording artist. In 1992, he received the Dove Award for the Song of the Year, Be the One. The Dove Awards are the church world equivalent to the Grammy Awards. Be the One has been sung in this room. It stirs us to action. In a world of broken dreams, where the truth is hard to find. For every promise that is kept, there are many left behind. Though it seems that nobody cares, it still matters what you do, cause there's a difference you can make, but the choice is up to you. Will you be the one to answer to his call? Will you stand when those around you fall? Will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world? Tell me, will you be the one? Oh, sometimes it's hard to know who is right and what is wrong and where you are supposed to stand when the battle lines are drawn. There's a voice that is calling out for someone who's not afraid to be a beacon in the night to a world that's lost its way. There are still some battles that I must fight from day to day, yet the Lord provides the power for me to stand and say, I will be the one to answer to his call. I will stand when those around me fall. I will be the one to take his light into a darkened world. I will be the one. Will you be the one? Go now and live for the Savior. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.